Hello, I'm Kathleen Olive. Both Matisse and Picasso are credited with proclaiming Cezanne is the father of us all. In this episode, I speak with Limelight Arts Travel's Nick Gordon about Cezanne's trajectory as an artist, his approach to painting, his emergence from the traditions of Paris and his utter transformation of them, as well as his impact on painters from Pissarro to Braque. By taking a closer look, we discover more of what made Cezanne a modern master. Hi Nick, thanks very much for coming in today. Thanks Kathleen. Can you tell us please what painting you've chosen for us to look at today and give us a description of it for people who are listening along? Well today we're having a look at uh, Paul Cezanne's Monson Victoire with a large pine tree which is from the mid to late 1880s. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a view onto Monson Victoire in southern France uh, where, but we're not looking at the mountain directly. We're looking at it across from a slightly elevated position, uh, looking out across the fields, which are represented here with golds and greens, uh, from behind a large pine tree on the left-hand side, the branches of which then swoop over the top of the painting. So we're looking through, from, say, on the top of a hill, underneath the branches of a tree, out across these rich golden and green fields, to the monumental mountain, which is rendered here with beautiful shades of pale peaches, mauves, greens, and blues. And where would we see this painting if we wanted to stand in front of it today? It's in the Cook, uh, Cotold Institute in London. Thanks, Nick. So you've said that we're looking at a scene here that's set in southern France? Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so Cézanne had moved down from Paris to southern France uh, around the time that he makes a break with the Impressionists, so going in different directions. Uh, Cézanne is apparently a very difficult person to get along with, or at least some people find him a bit moody. Uh, and he decides he's not really interested in being in Paris, surrounded by all of that grey all of the time. Uh, so he retreats to southern France, uh, where he's able to then live in the sunlight and to be able to paint the rich colours of nature. And he picked scenes such as this, a single mountain, which you would then paint over and over and over uh, for the better part of 30 years. Mm. And so he's painting from life here. This is painted out in the landscape, uh, made from sketches, or is the entire work made on plein air? How did Cezanne work? He would spend a lot of time outside doing sketches in plein air, uh, both uh, oil sketches as well as watercolour sketches. But then he was ultimately a studio painter. Uh, and for works like this, which is fairly significant in size, he would be working from a combination of memory, from sketches. Uh, so it's an image that's built up in his mind over repeated looking. And he would uh, write about this too, that kind of he would look at something from one angle, uh, see the immense beauty of nature, and then move just one foot to the left or the right, and he would see revealed to him another beautiful element of the same thing. So we're looking at not something he could paint in plain air, what we're looking at is an image that he has uh, been able to create through repeated looking over the course of decades and repeated sketching, uh, repeated painting. So Cezanne is clearly spending a lot of time immersed in nature and nature here has a real presence and a force in this artwork. How is he conveying that energy and force of the natural world here? Well, it's something that he learned while he was in Paris uh, from Pizarro. Uh, it seems that Pizarro is there influencing artist after artist after artist. But if you look at Cezanne's early works, he's using quite a dull palette. He's using uh, quite uh, dull browns and greys, uh, which is drawing on, say, the realist school of painting. He's using a very thick sort of impastoed paint in a technique that he's learned from looking at Manet. Uh, but his works don't have that great vibrance we expect of, of a Cezanne. It's then that kind of while he's moping around, Pizarro takes him off into the countryside as a holiday, trying to get him out to really appreciate the beauty of nature and to try and introduce to him some sense of spontaneity, that once you go outside into the light, you look at the colours, you look at the way the wind rustles the leaves, the way it rustles the grass, and you try and capture some of that sense of being there in the moment. And from that point on, Cezanne never really looks backwards. 
Uh, so his uh, sense of the kind of the immediacy of nature is something he's partly learned from Bizarro, but then he takes off in all sorts of different directions through his use of colour uh, and through his very, uh, ooh, I suppose, um, very identifiable uh, brushwork. Yeah, the brushwork here is quite interesting because I see patches of colour that seem to kind of abut one another and then in other places they overlap and they're blended. What's he actually doing with colour and with his brush strokes here? Well, with colour, he's uh, borrowing from what was reasonably recent, a new colour theory, a colour wheel that had been designed by uh, uh, Chirivuil. And this colour wheel not only just had uh, colours ranging around it, it also had intermediate tones, so it gets uh, darker towards the centre and lighter towards the edge of that wheel. But rather than uh, just simply taking complementary or contrasting colours, uh, say, for example, simply putting a blue against an orange or a purple against a yellow or a red against a green, uh, which he did do in some of his early works, but he, he wrote about that and said that's just a two-card trick, kind of any fool can do that. Uh, but instead he comes up with a more complex theory where he starts introducing intermediate colours. So if you're looking at a colour wheel, to get from one point to your complementary contrast, you move about a third of the way around the, around the wheel. But to get to that point, Cezanne started introducing intermediate steps where you'd go through from, say, uh, a green to a red, you would go through a third colour. Uh, and that allows him to start creating a much greater st uh, strength of a sense of contour, a sense of a play of light, light bouncing around the place. Because it's not just simple a uh, big patch of one colour against a big patch of its opposite colour. He's always working through uh, a third colour uh, to get there. So can you give us an example in this work from the Courtauld where we could see that in action? Is there a particular place in this painting where we see him moving through those stages of colour in order to build up the contrasts? Absolutely. So if you look just straight to the mountain, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the mountain, uh, you'll notice there are patches of quite a vibrant blue, uh, and then it's got this kind of slightly muted orange colour, orangey-peachy colour. So those are complementary contrasting colours. But you notice that between those, the way he separates them is to add in some shades of green, uh, some green, some greeny grey colours. And that's a way of giving that sense of the extension of that blue. It just doesn't run into the colour beside it. it the colour slowly mutates and changes and then reveals the contrast. Uh, so it's a bit like, I suppose, uh, the resolution of a piece of music. You don't simply go from the beginning to the end and it's resolved. You have multiple steps. You stage your way through steps of colour to get to the resolution. Whereas in the foreground, it seems that he's actually stepping more distinctly from one to the next. So, for example, I'm looking at that patch at the lower right where we've got two fields of really deep green that are bordered quite sharply by a flash of an umbery orange colour. So what do you think the intent is in the foreground with those patches of field, those alternating sections of colour? Well, I think what he's doing there is he's drawing our attention to it. So those, as you point out, those kind of contrasts are much more vibrant, they're richer. That's partly because the colour is much more intense. It's a much more saturated colour that he's using than he is on the mountains. But what it does is it draws our attention. So we have that spot there on the right-hand side. You notice that it's then balanced by that orange building on the left-hand side. And then if you look between, the, between those towards the middle of the canvas at the base of the mountain, you've then got another flash of that orange set against the green. So these are like beacons in the night. If you're looking out over a bay at night, for example, we get these flashes of light telling you where the rocks are. In this case, Cezanne is using those as beacons to guide us from near the foreground uh, through the midground to the base of the mountain. So he's using them as a compositional device. The other thing that he seems to be using as a compositional device or as a, a, a way of guiding my eye around this painting is that when I look closely, the brush strokes are not uniform, they're not linear, they're not carefully blended. You know, sometimes they're going horizontally, sometimes they're going vertically like up the tree trunk. Other times they seem to be whipping around, the actual strokes seem to be whipping around like those branches of the tree that seem to be moved by quite a strong uh, wind. So why is he alternating brushstrokes in that way? 
it's partly a way of creating that sense of movement. Uh, but I think he's doing something a little more, a little bit more significant than trying to represent something invisible like the wind. And it's partly that those br uh, brush strokes, especially when they get longer and more visible, also help guide our eye. They create lines in a painting with very, very few lines. And by guiding us around, uh, it helps us kind of get a sense of motion. We don't, our eye doesn't settle on one place. We're being moved around by the different lines of the brushwork, uh, the different lines within the, the painting itself, such as that bridge on the right-hand side. And this keeps our eye moving around. It keeps us interested. It keeps us wanting to see more, able to see more in the painting than we would be able to see without those. The other aspect, I suppose, of this approach to painting is that Cezanne is not thinking of objects in space. So there's a tradition from the early Renaissance onwards of thinking of you create a space and you populate it with objects uh, as a way of mimicking a three-dimensional world. Cezanne is not really interested in that. He knows a painting is two-dimensional and he's not going to pretend that it's anything but two-dimensional. So none of these objects are objects in space for if, if Cezanne. All of these objects are just shapes and colours on a two-dimensional surface. So rather than trying to, say, paint the cloud as a distinctive object, the cloud then just becomes a vague shape and a combination of colours that are actually part of the sky. And if you look up, to, to push this side a further, if you look up towards the branches of the trees, the leaves of those branches in some places start blending into the sky and the clouds around them. They're not distinct objects, they're just part of an overall two-dimensional composition on a canvas. It does also seem to give some kind of a visual shimmer, this particular approach to the brush strokes, so that, for example, in those fields in, let's call it the foreground, although as you've said, you know, the traditional things aren't happening with space here. But in the foreground, there is a sense of kind of shimmering, hazy heat over the over the landscape in the foreground and then that kind of trembling energy in the sky as the, the clouds and the light and the branches and leaves all seem to somehow meld into one, as you've said. So what do you think is the overall mood or ambience that Cezanne is conveying here? Why, why does he want me to look onto this scene? I think he's trying to convey uh, a sense of complex majesty of the mountain, this extraordinarily beautiful chunk of rock uh, which reflects light in different ways. Uh, so he's trying to get us to look across that warmth of the landscape, uh, that sense of, sense of the seasonality, that sense of the energy of nature always buzzing around us. But I think at the same time, he's also trying to convey something to us about he, how he sees the world that he's able to look at the same thing over and over from slightly different positions and see new forms of beauty. And I think we can do that with this painting too. It doesn't let us settle in one place. We notice, say, for example, the warmth of those fields, the things that might be going on in those fields. We then notice a mountain, we notice the tree, we notice the sky, we notice different parts of the clouds, we notice the railway viaduct on the right-hand side, the tiny little house on the left-hand side. Uh, it's keeping us, uh, keep, he's keeping, um, I suppose, a, a way of uh, revealing to us the beauty that he sees in this scene. And we've talked a bit about the composition, but what you've just described when you've evoked the landscape, you've actually made me realise that in that landscape, which shimmers in the light, there are no humans. And it's quite an interesting perspective that we're given as viewers. We're kind of somehow suspended halfway up the trunk of the tree looking down onto this scene. It's quite an interesting kind of perspective or point of view, I suppose, that he sets up for us as viewers, and I think people respond so strongly to Cezanne's work as viewers of his art. But can you describe for us the kind of legacy he had for generations of artists who followed him? What was his impact? Uh, it's an extraordinarily large impact, although it was only beginning to be realised to, uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, so throughout from the 1870s right through into the, the mid to late 1890s, he's virtually unheard of. Most of his works are kind of just down, uh, hanging around in southern France. He has to constantly be cajoled by other artists to kind of bring his work out and show it occasionally. And his work is visible in Paris. Uh, in the gallery of uh, Julien Tanguy, for example, 
Uh, his work is there. Oh, we've got a gallery. It's a, an art paint, an art supply shop. He has a small artist paint shop. And artists like Pizarro are kind of looking at uh, Cezanne's work and are seeing he's doing these wonderful new things. It's also there that Van Gogh sees his first Cezanne and suddenly realizes the world is full of color. It doesn't have to be this muddy kind of realist stuff. It can be the beauty that we can see in nature. But outside of that, it's not really until he has a major exhibition in Paris until the later, in the later 1890s uh, that he's, his profile starts to take off. And then in the early 1900s, uh, as he's approaching the end of his life, he has a, a serious sequence of major exhibitions in Paris. And it's there that people like Matisse see him, there that Picasso sees him, there that Georges Braque sees him. And each of these artists are looking at what Cezanne has done and realise there is something so thoroughly modern. This is a very different way of understanding an artwork, that an artwork is more abstract than trying to capture a visual reality. Its shapes, its colours, its interaction of shape and colour on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, its use of brushwork that other artists uh, would look at and say, kind of, it looks unfinished. Why is it so sketchy? Why don't you paint the leaves rather than a general sense of the leaves moving in the wind? And that would go on to kind of really set a benchmark. It would push artists, uh, Braque, Picasso in particular, uh, to start developing uh, cubism, for example, uh, so much so that Braque goes down to southern France to paint the same places uh, that Cezanne painted and kind of develops cubism out of that. That's wonderful. Thanks very much for introducing us to such a beautiful work, Nick. You're welcome, Kelly. You've been listening to Limelight Arts Travels podcast, A Closer Look. It was recorded on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present.